Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has been made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge and love of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here ends our reading. Christians have always lived in a kind of creative tension between contemplation and action. Jesus was very active in the world, healing, feeding, speaking and making disciples. And he also needed quite frequently to draw apart from the world to a deserted place or a mountaintop to pray. He showed us that prayer need not be the opposite of action, but rather a complement to action. Jesus prayed a lot, according to the Gospels. He was praying when the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him like a dove at his baptism. He prayed all night before he chose his first disciples. He always blessed his food before he ate, and he blessed the children. He prayed prayers of rejoicing. He prayed for the cup of the crucifixion to pass him by. But in the end, he prayed for God's will to be done. He said a prayer of despair and abandonment on the cross and begged God to forgive his murderers, for they did not know what they were doing. He prayed a prayer commending his own soul to God. And after the resurrection, he prayed for and blessed the disciples. So if you've ever asked the question, why pray? One answer is simply this, Jesus did it. And Jesus taught us how to do it. He said not to get all caught up with composing long or eloquent prayers. The Lord's Prayer is short and to the point. Sometimes Jesus prayed for his disciples, and sometimes he prayed with them. Other times he drew apart. Silence, we learn from Jesus, is helpful for prayer at least some of the time. And silence seems to be one of those things where, for which it's difficult to achieve a real balance. Some people have almost no silence in their lives, and others might find that they have way, way too much. Henry Nowen, who was a priest, writer, and spiritual leader, wrote eloquently about our resistance to silence. He said, we know there's some connection between prayer and silence, 
But if we think about silence in our lives, it seems that it isn't always peaceful. Sometimes silence can be frightening. For many, silence is threatening. They don't know what to do with it. If they leave, leave the noise of the city behind and come to a place where cars, no cars are roaring, no ships are tooting, no trains are rumbling, when there's no hum of the radio or television, where no records or tapes are playing, they feel their entire body gripped by an intense unrest. For many of us, he concludes, silence has become a real disturbance. So you might suspect from this reference to records and tapes that now one wrote this some time ago, actually it was in 1972, how much more are now one's observations relevant today when so many of our lives are subject to the constant music playing in our ears or the interruption of a ding, a swoosh, a ringtone, or some other sound indicating an incoming text, email, call, or notification. So if you would like to get more conversations going with God, try turning down the noise and getting a bit more okay with silence. You might have to work your way up to it. Start with just a few minutes. And just like when you begin a new exercise program, don't lambast yourself for what you can't do. Go for small steps, consistent over time. And in the silence, just say some words to God. That's it. That is the beginning of prayer. So some years ago, Larry and I were visiting Istanbul. And I was struck by the Islamic call to prayer broadcast from mosques throughout the city five times a day. At dawn, at noon, mid-afternoon, dusk, and nightfall. And wouldn't it be nice, I thought, if Christians had a reminder five times a day to pray? Well, who says we can't? Whether it's a smartphone or an egg timer, why can't we build in reminders to pray during our days? Now, as Jesus showed us, not every prayer needs to be an all-nighter in a desert place. There are plenty of everyday prayers that can punctuate a life in all its activity and bustle. Only in this way can most of us do what Paul exerted the early Christians to do at Thessalonica and Colossus, pray without ceasing. May a meal remind us to say thanks to God and to the hands that grew, prepared, and served it. And paying attention to the world is a spiritual practice, as Larry Sasso's writing reminds us. We can get a spiritual connection to God who created all the earth and all its wonders. Taking a moment to see, truly see, a moth or a dog or a crescent moon is an entrance into the holy. Mary Oliver wrote this short poem called Praying. It doesn't have to be a blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention. Then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Now, speaking of another voice, it is easy to forget that a prayer is not a monologue, but it's meant to be a dialogue, a conversation. And that gets tricky because if we ever do get to a place of real silence, 
of calming our thoughts and being still, sometimes all we ever hear is, well, silence. So we've seen so many movies in which God sounds like James Earl Jones speaking clearly and resonantly that we forget that God indeed sometimes speaks in mysterious ways and multiple ways. So how do we listen to God? What are some aids to hearing God's messages for us? Sometimes God actually does seem to speak to people in words and in no uncertain terms. But in life, and even in the Bible, that does not happen all that often. Most people, most of the time, need to use other forms of discernment to figure out God's will. Many of us make that discernment more complicated and difficult than it needs to be. If we don't hear God telling us to go into accounting or ministry or music, we think God has not spoken to us. But in the Bible, God has spoken many times about what God wants for and from us. God wants us to choose the good, to stay close to God, to love God and our neighbors around the world, to serve, to forgive, to work for peace and justice, to keep the Ten Commandments, and to live in faith hope, and love, especially in love. God also speaks to us through the voice and voices of other people, trusted friends, even strangers, even very famous mystics like Teresa of Avila, the 16th century Spanish nun known for her very close relationship with and visions of God, even Teresa sought help in discerning God's will from spiritual companions. That's one reason why many of us gather in congregations in addition to connecting with God on our own. Sometimes other hearts and hands and voices are conduits for God's communication to us. So prayer, scripture reading, conversations with others, those are all hearing aids. But even then, sometimes the message is not 100% clear. As one spiritual advisor told me, sometimes a prayer of God, what do you want me to do here, is met with a divine shrug of the shoulders. Sometimes maybe God just wants us to use the minds that God gave us to figure things out for ourselves. In the end, the Apostle Paul told the early Christians, you will know you are doing God's work when that work bears fruit. Just like a tree is clearly healthy when it has abundant fruit on it, so our lives are aligned with God when the results of our labors are good. The results of our labors are good. When people are fed and healed, when others are brought to a knowledge and love of God, where charity and love prevail, their God is ever found. When good is increased, then God's will is being done. Now, early Christians were encouraged to pray for one another, and I will pray for you, and I ask that you would pray for me. As the author of the letter to the Colossians put it, I have not ceased praying for you and asking that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May it be so. Amen.